Good afternoon, everyone, um, and thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Steph Kershaw, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use, which is located at the University of Sydney. And I'm also the project coordinator for Cracks in the Ice. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's special webinar. Uh, now, before we begin our webinar, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I am currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also further like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respects to their elders past, present and future. So today's presentation is one in a series of webinars which is focused on crystal methamphetamine um, or alcohol and other drugs. Now before I introduce today's speaker, I just want to let you know that as participants you are in listen-only mode uh, and this means that you uh, can't uh, hear us, uh, we can't, sorry, hear or see you. However, you will have a Q&A button on your dashboard uh, and this is where you can type in any questions that you have during the webinar or if you're having any issues and you'll notice that Felicity's put in a message through the chat now. Now, if you think of any questions during the webinar, please do put them through the Q&A button as we will be having a question and answers section at the end of the webinar. I'd also like to let you know that we will be recording today's session and making the recording available through the Cracks in the Ice website. So now to the interesting part, I would like to uh, introduce you to our speaker today, Professor Francis K. Lampkin. So Professor K. E. Lampkin is currently the Interim Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of Newcastle. Uh, she's actually on a leave of absence from her role as an NHMRC Senior Research Fellow Director of Technology Innovation and Translation at the NHMRC Premise Centre for Research Excellence. And also with all her spare time, she's the co-director of the Mental Health Hub of the University of Newcastle's Priority Research Centre in Brain and Mental Health. Um, now, Professor Kay Lampkin's research and clinical program has been instrumental in demonstrating the transformative impact of digital technologies, integrating uh, treatments to the point of care for people with co-occurring mental health and substance use problems. And just last year, she was awarded the Hunter Medical Research Institute Research Excellence Award, which is the highest accolade awarded to a medical researcher for the institution. And it's based on significant career contribution to medical science. So we are absolutely delighted and honoured to have uh, Professor Kay Lapkin with us today and to talk about a new program which she has developed. So thank you so much, Professor. I will hand over to you to make the presentation. Thank you so much, Steph, and to the wonderful people who are joining us today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to dip my toe back into um, a ver an area of research and, and clinical work that I'm extremely passionate about, um, have a strong personal connection to, so thank you for this opportunity. I would really also like to acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the lands of the Pambaron clan of the Awabakal people and also pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging uh, here on, on the country from which I'm joining you. And the reason I'm particularly uh, wanting to make an acknowledgement of country is that when I think about uh, my Aboriginal friends and the communities that I have the honour of, of engaging with up here, I get a strong sense of the importance of, of connection and of storytelling um, as, as a way to pass on culture, shared values, history, um, and the things that are important um, and that make the Aboriginal nations um, who they are. And I also think, um, and I've been, I've been told and I'm learning that it's a, a really important way of instilling knowledge of, of mind, body and soul. Um, and also that people um, with whom you share your stories within our Aboriginal communities and, and elder communities um, are really experienced and trusted knowledge keepers. Um, and, and telling the story, um, from what I understand, is a real way to forge connections between people, can help teach people and help inspire people. Um, and also, as I, I've mentioned, can kind of create that um, shared cultural values, that shared history, 
um, that really does unite people. And I think I'm hoping um, that as you see what um, I'm presenting today and hear what I'm presenting today about the experiences of people who are supporting a loved one um, with an alcohol and other drug use um, problem or concern, that it is this need for, for storytelling and this need for connection um, that they are really talking about and that we've really tried to address with the launch um, of this wonderful program that I'll tell you more about today. So that's what I'm thinking about, just to, in, in thinking and, and wanting to acknowledge the country from which I'm joining you today. Um, in terms of acknowledgements, I'd also like to acknowledge our incredibly hardworking and wonderful inspirational project partners. Our program is funded by a, a contract and grant from the Australian Government Department of Health. And we have wonderful people from the University of Newcastle here, where I'm joining you from today, from the Matilda Centre, uh, where Steph uh, and Felicity are joining you from today, um, and the work of the NHMRC Centre of Research Excellence um, in the prevention of mental illness and substance use also contributes to our program. And so I can see um, the amazing Dara Sampson is online, as well as under other wonderful members from our team here in Newcastle. And I want to thank and acknowledge them for all the hard work and inspiration and time they've spent walking with people with a lived experience of um, caring and looking after a loved one with an alcohol or other drug use problem and who really have brought this program um, to us to the point today where we can, um, we can launch it and have it accessible. Um, before I show you this program, and I'm very excited to do so, I wanted to talk with you um, about how it developed and what we're basing the content and the structure and, and the functioning of the program on. So the program is FFSP, Family and Friends Support Program. If you have any ideas for some, any better uh, labels for the program, please let us know. Um, but for now, it's FFSP. And um, the thing that's really important to us, as well as being based on evidence from people with a lived experience, of having a loved one uh, with an alcohol or drug use problem. We also base our programs on the latest and best evidence from around the world for what can best help people to, uh, to support um, their loved one, but also navigate their own journey in that role as, um, as looking after, caring for, as, as having in their lives um, a loved one who's experiencing an alcohol or the drug use problem. So the types of evidence that I'll talk you through very briefly uh, in the first part of this presentation include um, a systematic review. So our team undertook a, a comprehensive review of all the evidence and all the projects and programs and experiences that have been published in the literature internationally to date uh, to try to tease out what the most effective components of the interventions are that we know of and that have been tested with a view to making sure that those elements were incorporated into FFSP. We also wanted um, evidence um, and input and co-design from people with a lived experience of a loved one who uses alcohol and other drugs. And so we went about this in somewhat of a, a widespread or arbitrary way to start with by conducting an online survey, inviting people uh, with that lived experience to share some of that experience with some structured questionnaires and also some open-ended um, questions where they could really document and talk, tell their story, if you like, um, about the, their experiences um, of having a loved one who used our call other drugs. We then from that group asked for some people who to volunteer, could volunteer to do some phone, um, phone interviews with us over time uh, to really delve deeper into that experience and journey and help us really understand what the needs are and what the experiences are for people who have this lived experience. And so we had, uh, so we've done 17 interviews to date uh, to inform the project and the program that you'll see in a moment. And of those, we had um, a range of people who were in a, a varying um, degrees of, of closeness and, um, and, and relationships with people um, who were using alcohol and other drugs. So we had four of our people um, who were daughters of people who were using alcohol and other drugs. Um, we had nine people, um, I guess the rest of them were either a partner or a sibling, an ex-partner, um, a friend, a son um, and a grandson. So although they're small numbers, we have very detailed um, experiences um, from these people and they are from different perspectives of, of giving love and giving care to someone with an alcohol and the drug use um, problem. So to the literature first, and we wanted to have a look at um, what programs and supports and evidence was about available to support a family member, um, a significant other, a spouse, a wife, a husband, a sibling, a friend, a caregiver of any sort who was engaged in, in uh, the care of or feeling some responsibility or impact from somebody else who they love who was using alcohol or the drugs. 
And we really took an approach here that uh, was, the literature, as you'll see in a moment, really um, told us that there are a couple of ways in which um, people consider accessing treatment or support um, in this context of being a caregiver or seeking support for alcohol and other drug use in a loved one. And the programs that we uh, that you identi that we identified and that are out there either focus on encouraging and supporting and facilitating that family member or loved one to encourage the person who's experiencing the alcohol or the drug use problem into treatment. As it, or, and the other way of looking at it is um, the, the evidence that's before us suggests that there are a, a range of programs and interventions that actually try to help build up the strength and the resilience and the coping skills of the family member or the friend themselves, um, irrespective of what's happening in the lives of their loved one who's using alcohol and other drugs. So you can probably start to understand that the types of, of supports that you might provide are very, very different depending on that focus that you take. But for at least for our systematic review, we wanted to get a bit of an idea of what that scope or that range um, of, of intervention was. And so we did this broadly across alcohol and all substances. And we also were mainly focusing on psychosocial, psychological interventions. So talking therapies, coping skills therapies, as opposed to pharmacological and, and other sorts of, of interventions. And so here are some of the search terms that we threw in to try to capture our, um, our search and, and the articles and the evidence that we were interested in and wanted to know more about. And for people uh, amongst us who might want a, a bit more detail on how we went about this, you can look this up on the Prospero registration um, website and delve into a bit more deeper detail of how we went about this. Okay. In just, a, I guess, in a bit of a narrative way, what we were able to find um, from the evidence that was available was that there are a range of different um, techniques and components associated with effective interventions. Um, to be honest, there weren't um, a lot in the literature that we found, given that, that um, there are a lot, there are many more interventions out there for alcohol and other drug use for people who are experiencing those um, issues um, directly. There was far less about how family members and friends could really be supported to um, uh, in that in that journey, either for um, supporting themselves or supporting their loved one. And so we only were able to identify 52 um, articles out of all of the published literature that really address these sorts of issues. So what do they use when they um, develop these interventions? So drug education is important. So family members really need to know and want to know more about what it is that their person in their life is using and, and, and what the impacts are um, on that person and what the pharmacological effects are of the drug. Um, there's lots of coping skills, um, goal setting, and, and particularly communication skills in some of the most effective um, interventions. So really upskilling and empowering the family member to have some of the, the conversations that really do need to, to occur between them and their loved one in their lives who's using alcohol and other, drug use, uh, other drugs. Um, really, um, there are um, a lot of, of interventions that take what we call a motivational approach. Um, and so working with the family member to build their, their confidence and build their readiness to have some of the uh, more direct conversations uh, and put in place some of the more, I guess, direct strategies that they might think they need to do in order to best help or encourage the person in, in their lives um, into treatment. Um, the other components of interventions are about how to um, make good decisions, um, how to manage um, negative emotions, both in, in the context of the person themselves who's using alcohol and other drugs, but also the often the consequent emotions and feelings that the family member or loved one who's trying to support that person can often um, experience. And there was a big theme around um, societal stigma, not just for the person who's using alcohol and other drugs, but the, for the family and the loved ones um, embroiled in that experience with uh, a lot of isolation, a lot of relationship breakdown um, that's a result of, of that experience. And so for those of us um, who either work clinically in this area or who are living that experience right now of, of looking after and loving somebody who has an alcohol and a drug use problem, I'm sure these are the sorts of things that you don't need any evidence for. That This is probably what I'm hoping this is, um, I guess, ticking a few boxes in terms of what your lived experience is. To try and certainly um, send some Q&A through um, if that's not the case or if you are identifying uh, with any of this um, evidence uh, from the broader international literature. 
To the online survey interviews, I just wanted to take a little bit of time to share with you some of the experiences and the reflections that the 371 people who completed our online survey shared with us, and then in more detail of the 17 people who provided us um, much more insight um, and, and I guess access to their personal stories. Uh, so we, sought, we sent out invitations to complete the online survey through Facebook, and as I have mentioned, 371 people um, responded to that invitation and completed our online survey survey. 90% of these were female and that's um, probably a bit more than what we were expecting um, but often we do see um, people who identify as female being more likely to engage um, in these sorts of online surveys and perhaps more likely to identify themselves as caring for somebody with an experience of a lot, uh, an alcohol or drug use issue. We had an average age of our participants or our respondents to the survey of 46 years, but we had people from uh, you know as young as 18 up to the age of 70 who also wanted to provide their um, expertise and, and share their experiences. And of those, we had three people who identified as an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person. What was important for us to consider, and, and certainly meets with the epidemiology and the population stats that we, um, we see and we read on drug and alcohol use um, in the Australian community, is that for most people, and I'm struggling to think of even one person um, who responded to our survey who thought that there was only one, um, one issue or one um, primary drug or alcohol um, use that was the concern. Overwhelmingly, the majority of people um, out there are trying to manage your multiple concerns and often with multiple or poly um, alcohol and other drug use. Um, and that kind of complicates not only getting treatment and, and helping the person with those experiences with uh, the alcohol and other drug use um, issues, but also in, in, in understanding from the loved one's perspective what that might mean for, for behaviour and, and symptoms and side effects um, and toxicity effects uh, and also I guess the other consequences of, of using multiple substances um, at once. But for our survey, we asked people to, to reflect on what they thought or what they were mostly concerned about concerned about in their loved one. And for the most part, people were primarily worried about their, uh, their loved one's alcohol use, um, to a lesser extent cannabis um, and crystal methamphetamine use, ice use, um, to a lesser extent heroin use and then prescription opiates. So we did have a bit of a range of, of experiences and, and reflections based on different types drugs that people were concerned about in their loved ones lives. So when we actually ask them what, uh, not just what drug is concerning you, but what concerns you most um, about the person in your life's use of alcohol or other drugs. And what was interesting is that, that somewhat independently of the type of drug that the person was is using that their loved one is concerned about, the concerns are, are the same. So there's been negative impacts on the relationships with family and friends, relationship breakdowns, and in you know, extreme cases, loss of custody of children, lots of worries about the long-term impact impacts of chronic use, not only on physical health, but on mental health, a real sense of being of change, of loss of the person who um, the, the loved one had the relationship and still has the relationship prior to the alcohol and other drug use, um, but also really um, a, a loss of role function. So that person who's using the alcohol or other drugs really isn't able to function in the same way um, to support the, the relationship, to support the family or to do the activities of daily living um, that are really uh, important um, in keeping a family or relationships together. There were also reports of verbal um, and physical abuse, unpredictability and paranoia and aggression, and also in severe cases, some, some really quite um, um, concerning consequences of criminal activity, loss of licences and those sorts of things. And here are some of the quotes that our people in our interviews, but also in our open-ended questions on the survey, um, provided just as a bit of a, a more detailed reflection of, of what this is like to live this day to day. Um, so things like just barely being able to remember what our relationship was like before the alcohol and other drug use was around. Um, and also looking at, um, that again, this second quote here, reflecting that loss of, of function and loss of um, input and partnership into the daily activities of the household. We also ask people to reflect on what life has been like for them um, in this support role of having a loved one in their lives with alcohol and other drug um, use concerns. Um, so really a sense that, that the dependency of the person in terms of their loss of their role function, inability to work and, and so forth causes a, an understandable financial strain, but also uh, maybe a less obvious burden of, of additional parental or familial responsibilities, a real instability in the home life, um, and that the, the people themselves um, really carry physical and psychological 
stress, um, and some even um, reported mental health issues, including depression and anxiety in themselves as a consequence of this experience. Um, again, as I've um, alluded to, that idea of, of grief and loss, loss of a partner and a parent and the grief around that, but the person, um, it, it's, it's a complicated grief that people experience because the person is still there in their life. And probably not, and I don't think it's, um, it's surprising, but real trust issues, anger and resentment um, around the chaos um, and the dependency and the burden of, of the life that perhaps nobody really signed up for. And here are some um, example or exemplar um, statements and quotes and reflections from people um, with the lived experience um, of supporting a loved one with alcohol or the drug use to, to bring some of these codes or categories to life. Um, so just take a moment to let you read and, and talk over the top as you do so, but just to really bring home the, the embarrassment and the shame that people feel um, for, in their words, almost allowing this to happen or allowing this or, or that this is part of their lives. Um, lots of, um, of, of words around it being depressing and destroying, extreme emotional and mental stress. And really that last comment about um, feeling like you're being on a roller coaster that you just can't get off. Um, and certainly that feeling of of, of, of a loss of hope for things to be different in the future was, was um, a real theme coming through. In terms of supports, and I think this is one of the things um, people might want to talk a little bit about more in our Q&A section a little later if, if they're interested. Um, there, there was a range of experiences that people were able to tell us about um, in actual Accessing supports, whether within their social network or health professionals who may be in contact with uh, their loved one who's having, who has the alcohol or the drug use problem, or GPs or other sorts of service providers and supports, um, professional service providers and supports for the person um, in that caring um, experience, that, um, in that family and friend experience. And so um, there, there was certainly a lot of uh, um, statements and a lot of quotes from people that, that suggested that they were quite open and willing to utilise a wide range of networks um, and, uh, you know, both formal and informal networks and a real desire and a want to do that. Um, but what we do see from this graph here is that particularly for for formal mechanisms of support from health professionals, those blue bars there indicate the number of people who've never actually sought support from a health professional for any of the, um, I guess, the emotional and other impacts that they're experiencing themselves as people who love someone with an alcohol and other drug use problem. Um, one of the um, important things to realise is that, that people do try to lean on their social networks in these situations. Um, and you can see again from the graph there that there are varying levels of success that people did, um, not only in terms of accessing uh, their social networks, but really in having people, friends and relationships who felt like they, they were um, able to, to spend the time listening to the person's experience, being there to talk about um, their feelings um, and talk about the concerns and worry that the person has for their loved one with an alcohol and other drug use problem. Um, and I think that that's really, uh, really important because um, it maybe speaks a bit to that social and societal stigma that people feel in relation to alcohol and other drug use and the impact that it has on families. Um, and so what we can see from the, I guess, the first three bars um, of the graph before you is really that, that family and friends um, who responded to our survey really only once or twice felt like somebody in their social network was really able to listen to them, talk about the person in their lives using alcohol or other drugs without kind of judgment and without jumping in and, and criticising and, um, and offering um, advice that sometimes might be good for the right advice or might be what we all know we need to do, but, but just wasn't very supportive at that particular um, point in time. And again, just to make the point that we really um, didn't capture a sample in our survey who really had found a way to access formal supports for their experiences. And, and maybe that's also because, um, as we'll see in a moment, the focus of the person is really not on themselves and their own um, emotions and, and coping skills, and it's really on the person um, in their lives with alcohol and other drug use, and, and that seems to be the priority there. So in asking us, um, our interviewees uh, and our survey respondents, what they thought um, could be done to help them um, navigate these waters, the first, these are some of the ideas. 
So um, again, just coming back to that idea of connection and storytelling, support groups were considered to be really, really important, either face-to-face -face or online. And certainly that idea of being able to share a story with somebody with a peer who's been through a similar, not the exact, but a similar kind of situation was felt um, like it could be a very sort of trusting and unifying and helpful experience. Um, that additional counselling really um, could be made available for families um, of people who are supporting alcohol, uh, people using alcohol or other drugs, and that maybe there could be some additional case management support for the person themselves who's using alcohol or other drugs to, to ease some of that burden on carers. So there really was that idea that in between the appointments, if they were able to get their loved one um, engaged with a treatment program, that really still a, a huge amount of what, what um, our respondents are calling case management, management of the day to day was really falling on, on them. And that does have financial and practical um, implications. Um, and again, here are some quotes to demonstrate that um, in a little more detail. Um, wanting to have more access to information and support services. Um, again, with a focus on assisting them, help um, coping with their partner's drug use, um, online supports, professional consultation, um, and certainly someone who really knows what it's like um, to walk beside you and, and just seek support from is important. And when we asked um, people to think about how they would best like to receive this kind of support, uh, again, and maybe COVID's influenced this a little bit, but there were varying ways in which people were, were prepared to, to reach out and access support with a real um, idea that, this, that, that these sorts of supports needed to be available somewhat around the clock. Um, the, the, particularly with some sorts of drugs, um, the experience can be very chaotic, um, can be very... Um, I guess out of control, I guess that's what chaotic means. And so having to then um, make, make appointments through the daytime or keep appointments um, can be somewhat difficult for a person who's caring for a loved one um, with an alcohol or other drug use problem. Um, and especially in a sense of that care or that person wants to feel like they're there to be able to step in when that person needs them. And so certainly having web-based um, supports, online chat rooms and, and online options that could be available after hours um, is seen to be really, really important in this space. So hopefully for people who have joined us today, those sorts of experiences, that evidence that we were able to get, um, gather and, and tap into and learn from is, is speaking to your experience, uh, whatever that may be, um, in working with um, or, or working with loved ones who have a family member or a friend using um, alcohol or other drugs. And so we tried to do justice to those experiences and that evidence and also bring to that our team's clinical experience um, and also experience working with people, um, both with alcohol and the drug use problems and families and friends to develop FFSP, um, our Family and Friends Support Program, which is an online program. And I'm very, very happy and very proud to say that it is available from today free of charge around the clock to anybody who would like to access some additional support for their journey and experience um, in supporting a loved one with alcohol and other drug use problems. So you'll see the website here, www.aod.ffsp.com.au. You'll see this pop up on just about all the slides that I'll show you from, um, from now on. And I really do encourage you to hop on and have a look at the program. We'd love to hear your thoughts, um, your feedback on the program, and we really will then be looking to engage with people as we undertake some research to work out whether it's doing what we hope um, it, 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 can, it was designed to do and that is to ease the, ease the journey and help the journey of someone as they try to navigate the storm um, of supporting a loved one with an alcohol and other drug use problem. And you probably realise I'm talking in some metaphors now. I don't tend to do that a lot, um, but I am with this particular program because as we were talking with people um, with their lived experience, we were getting a real sense that um, that this the storm or the, the, the seas was a really good metaphor that, that people could really connect with and relate to. Um, and that sometimes those seas are calm and sometimes those seas are rocky. Um, and the, the real challenge for, for us as people who are walking alongside um, those that are you know, on that journey with someone who has an alcohol or other drug use um, problem is that we, we can't really be in the water with somebody, otherwise we'll um, drown as well. We need to be trying to live with it 
and not in it. And so that's a really important concept that really connected a lot of our um, people's experiences for whom we spoke with. Um, and then also we've tried to weave in through the elements of our program. Now, much to Steph and Felicity's um, anxiety, I'm going to attempt to show you um, a little video that hopes to um, orient people just to this idea and this concept um, from within our um, FFSP program. So if you bear with me, hopefully um, you'll be able to see uh, and I'll play this for you now. Hi, Francis. Um, the video is working beautifully, but we can't actually hear any sound. Okay. None at all? No, sadly not. Okay, well, I might pause that. I wonder if I... You're just teasing us, so we'll go and look at the online program, aren't you, Francis? Oh, That's what you're really right. doing. So Okay. So a teaser and hopefully um, you will go on as Steph said um, and check that out. Um, and I, I think the one, the thing that I love about, I love about this program is that we, there are, there is some text there for people to read through, but we have tried to integrate um, videos with clinicians um, and with other people from our team so people can really see and connect with us um, who are sitting behind um, this program so that it's not just interacting with a website um, or a computer in the absence of having um, real people sitting behind it. Um, so again, I'd be really keen to hear your thoughts um, on that as you dive into that program a little more. Steph, I'll just check that you can still hear me okay. Yes, I can. Sorry, my mute, unmute button was far away and it took me a while to drag my mouse. But yes, I can hear you perfectly. One of the most uh, common and unifying experiences of, of 2020, that old mute button. All right. What I'll do now um, with your indulgence is just take you on a, a little journey of, of our own through the FFSP program. Um, so again, I'll draw your attention to the website that's down the bottom of the page there and that's available now for people to click on. Um, and you're very welcome to work your own way through that pro this program and, and have a good look at it and register now um, as I talk us through the various program components. And please shoot through any questions or any thoughts or comments um, as we do so. So we've divided the program into three key components. The first of which is an online program, which has some, some automated videos, um, activities, and it information um, really to help people um, understand where they are and um, what, what their needs might be and how to build some skills to support them um, on their journey in, in supporting a loved one with alcohol and other drug use problems. We then have a section of the a site called Helpful Activities, which is where um, people can bookmark particular aspects of that online program um, or, uh, or, or store videos um, or load videos um, uh, within and, and outside the program so they can come back to them at any time um, and revisit them um, or, um, or, or access them later, um, not without having to go through the online program. And then finally, we have a component that's about real stories, where people we've spoken with through our online survey, our interviews and our clinical experiences have really shared what it's like to support someone who uses alcohol and other drugs. So people can access those stories there, they can add their own stories to the community. Um, and um, within the coming months, we'll be able to launch an online social network where people can do this in real time in a very interactive and supportive peer networked way. So firstly, to the online program, I'd love to take you through what these components are. So when you access the program, it's the our online program is split kind of into two components, the core modules and then what we're calling um, our skill modules. So these core modules, there are four of them. They only take about um, 15 to 20 minutes, I guess, to, to sit down and do from start to finish each. And we think these sort of set the, the building blocks for the rest of the modules that, that come. So this is really helping guide a person who, who is supporting a loved one using alcohol and other drugs to really take stock of, of where they are right now. What's the most pressing and important important issues that they're worried about, whether that be them themselves or from the perspective um, of the person they're supporting. Um, 
um, and, and helping them really understand and map out a pathway through all the chaos and the stormy seas um, that, that characterises many a person's journey um, in that supporting role. So um, again, you can see this, this, this sailing metaphor is, is carried throughout um, this program, uh, this part of the program. And so let me take you through some of the particular components of these online of the uh, of the, these first core modules. What we've tried to do is really take what we've called a values based approach um, to particularly these first four modules. One of the um, uh, real um, challenges that, that people um, shared with us was this idea of, of when you're um, supporting and loving someone who's using alcohol and other drugs, particularly if you're in a, um, a partner to partner relationship or a parent to child relationship, um, and maybe somewhat from a, a, you know, a child to parent relationship, that there's this real um, uh, um, struggle between knowing in your heart that you need to be hard and you need to set some rules and some boundaries around what's acceptable behaviour and what's not acceptable um, within the home and sometimes that can be if there are other people living in the home the need to protect them um, in those times of real of real chaos and real disruption but at the same time that there's a person who's using um, the, the alcohol or the other drug who is um, is your son or your daughter who is your um, husband or wife or partner who is your mum or your dad and who you love and when you're in that role there are certain things that you might value about yourself um, in that role so as a mum um, you're going to be there for your kids all the time um, and, and make sure you try to create a safe and secure space for them to fall for example and sometimes it's really hard to walk both of those lines um, you know to set some rules and boundaries um, and and to, to stay close to your values and so what we try to do with this first um, these core modules is help the person who's supporting um, a loved one with alcohol or drug use understand what are the values that are most important to them um, and how can they act more in line with those values somewhat independently of what's going on um, with the person who's using alcohol and drugs. So we start that by um, helping a person kind of tell and author their own story. So we can see down the left here, we've got all the various aspects of module one. Of module one. We'll use that video, um, which you might, you could have seen if we had sound, you could have seen if we had sound that you saw, but we didn't have sound for, um, that, that sets the scene for this, this kind of module. We get people to consider what a day is like in their life, what the impact of the alcohol and the drug use is on various important people in, in the, the, the family or friend, uh, friend's life, and then help them um, share that story or write that story about what's that, what that is like. And so people don't have to come up with all of these ideas on their own. They can use these little um, uh, tiles here to click on them, to add them to their story. And there are also opportunities for people to indeed add their own um, examples of the impact that, that this experience is having on themselves and others. We then help people to um, describe in a bit more detail what that impact is like. And we get them to do that um, in, from, a, from the perspective of all the other people in the network that, of, um, of loved ones that they're worried about, not just the person who's using the alcohol um, or the other drug. Um, so we then help them um, um, author that story and then they can share that story with the community in a way that I'll, I'll show you in just a moment. What we also try to do is, as I mentioned, help people um, understand and identify what their values are. So we ask them to do this very, very easily and a little bit arbitrarily just to start that process off by helping them. Um, we give them some cards and we ask them to sort various um, values um, into not very important, moderately important or highly important. Um, so that's just a little activity that takes um, you know, less than five minutes to do. And what we then try to do is get people to focus on those values they put into the highly important category and to really identify and think about how well they've been able to live those values in the recent past. They nominate their top five and they then nominate um, some uh, these top five, which you can see down here, you can see three of them, to try to help put into practice a little bit. And then we give them people some skills to learn how to put those sorts of things into practice and, and live a little according to their values. It's a really simple task, which we found extremely helpful and powerful in just helping shift the focus for people um, off having to um, have the person in their life completely stop using alcohol or other drugs uh, before they they can make some changes um, in their own lives. Um, so again, I'd be interested in, in, in hearing from people who've been able to work through that activity and, and um, can provide some feedback on whether that's your experience as well. 
So people work through those online, those core modules online in their own time. They can come backwards and forwards to it. They can stop and start and so forth. And then once they get to the end um, of, of perhaps being able to identify some areas of their life where they might be able to make some changes and make some improvements and get some help right now, um, we then provide what we call some mini modules or skill modules to help them um, work out how to make that happen. So the mini modules are, um, so there are seven there. They help they do things like um, help people work out um, who in their um, network and what activities they might want to do to help um, feel more supported. We teach people how to manage and identify unhelpful thought patterns, how to manage worries um, in the middle of the night when a person might not have come home worrying about what their uh, future might be like and so forth. Um, helping teach them things like mindfulness just to help with some of the day-to-day -day low level distress that they might be experiencing. Helping them with um, emergency planning, so what to do in times of high chaos or crisis. Um, communication skills and navigating those values and relationships um, and also what to do um, when things become a bit too um, overwhelming. And I would say that what we've done in designing these mini modules is really try to take the perspective of the person who is in that position of providing care and love for someone with alcohol and the drug use and what they might be able to do or to skill them up a little bit more to make their journey a little more easier. Not that we're ignoring what's happening with the person who's using alcohol and other drug use, and I'll get to that in just a moment, but really what we want to do is create a bit of time and space and a bit of structure and help for a person who's in that caring role to navigate what that's like and to help them understand where it is that they might need, um, need some help and to almost do the thinking for them so they don't have to do that themselves or on their own. So again, here are some um, screenshots from within some of the mini modules or those skill modules about how we do that. Um, we've tried to make it user friendly. We've tried to make it fairly easy to complete. Um, and, um, and this is just an example of how we teach a person to be their own cognitive behaviour therapist. So this is trying to identify some of the thoughts and the feelings that people are experiencing in their caring role and their loving role um, that really are, 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 are tying them up in knots and just teaching them how to, to disentangle all of those feelings and behaviours from their thoughts and then help them manage and, and cope with those, um, those thoughts and feelings and behaviours. We also do this um, in, in a different way in emergency planning for those rough seas by helping a person um, sit down and, and work out in advance what they might do if they're in a particularly difficult or emergency type situation. And again, what we've tried to do is based on the lived experience and the co-design of people who've contributed to this, uh, this program is to identify some of the big big things, the big situations that can happen um, that we really need to be a bit more prepared for. Uh, so you can select those and get some tips and ideas of what might need to be in place to manage those situations. But also here you can add your own managing, your own, your own difficult situation um, and then organise some supports or do some thinking, some guided thinking around um, how to cope with those situations when and if they might occur. And this is how we do that. So again, um, if you've completed previous modules, all sorts of um, little tiles will pop up here based on what you've bookmarked or what you thought might be helpful as you've been working your way through the other modules. They all pop up here um, ready for you to then drop into the skills and strategies and techniques that you might use to cope with that particular situation um, or emergency that you uh, uh, have identified and are worried about. Um, so this is a very simplistic way using our own, um, uh, our own clinicians examples here but certainly there'll be some more ways that, um, that and, um, and I guess um, more complex ways that people will want to work through it. Um, and then we help people just work their way through um, that process of being able to manage that situation in advance and people can bookmark that, save it on their phones or their devices and come back to it when and if those, those situations um, arise. I've mentioned it a couple of times, but on each of the pages of our online program, there are some additional features. Uh, so again, so we have this um, icon here that's a bookmark um, that allows a person to bookmark that page and that will then get put into our, um, our helpful resources tab um, that I mentioned right at the very beginning that allows a person to access that particular page or that particular activity um, at a time um, outside when they're sitting down uh, or completing that program. 
We also have a print function. You can print the current page either to a PDF and save it onto your device, onto your phone or onto your laptop or print it out if you want to. Um, and then finally, um, this little book icon can take you to a cool, uh, the, the toolkit, which I'll talk about in a moment, where there are a number of other um, resources that you might be able to find helpful. And this is where we start to address some of the, the helpful resources and tools to help the loved one in your life with their alcohol or drug use concern. And here's what that looks like when you go to that toolbox. So here are the activities and the videos and the audio that are available throughout the program that you can bookmark and automatically will then um, land in each one of these categories so that you could be know, sitting on a bus um, and listening to the audio associated with a particular program as a bit of a revision. Um, and certainly the same with the videos and certainly the same with the activities and strategies that people work through um, as they complete the various components of the program. We also have this final um, book here called Resources, um, and that's the, the tab that I referred to on the, on the previous page. And this is really borne out by that um, experience of people who are supporting a loved one um, who really think that many of the issues and problems, and it's probably it's true, would be solved if the person um, in their lives with the alcohol and the drug use problem could seek support and seek help for that. Um, and so certainly we've got lots of comments about wanting to have more access to information and support services that it can assist people to, to manage that aspect um, of their journey. And so um, under these resources section um, in FFSP, uh, we have lots of resources and tips for um, how people themselves can help um, start to work on and make changes in their alcohol and other drug use concerns. And we also have a range of um, drug specific opportunities and resources that people can then go off and find more information out about um, or, or seek support from. And so an example for alcohol is um, a, a ready directory of all the different types of services in a person's local area. Uh, and this is kind of, I guess, a little clearinghouse of all the available online and in-person tools um, and services that are available to help someone manage their own alcohol use problem. We also do this um, not only with support services, but also with fact sheets and information sheets around each of the drug types. And there are more than, than is listed here. So if you go and you can have a look at those. Um, an example will um, tell you about each of the main websites that we that are available that provide these sorts of information and a bit of a description about what you can find if you go to those um, active links off site. So hopefully we've provided ready access to people um, to then um, go and access good, high quality, evidence-based information about the particular alcohol or other drug use issue um, that the person in their lives is, is trying to manage. And just finally, we have our real stories um, section, which I think, again, as I alluded to in the beginning, is, is a really critical and important part of this program. People have agreed to share their stories of supporting a loved one with alcohol and other drug use uh, with our FFSP community and users. So these are featured throughout the entire program, either as individual quotes on relevant pages within our online program and modules, but also at the end, um, some, some really uh, longer stories where people have really um, talked about their personal experiences. Um, and then as I, I mentioned a little earlier, part of our early work in those core modules of FFSP is around helping people create their own story, tell their own story, and then they have the option of being able to share that with our community um, of registered users on FFSP. Uh, so that's all that I'd like to cover today. Well, sorry, I'd like to cover lots and lots and lots more. Um, I'm pretty passionate about this program. I'm proud of the co-design and the input that we've had um, from people with the lived experience of alcohol and the drug use, and I hope we've done justice to that experience. Um, please take time um, to access our program, and if you're willing, share with us your experiences, both with the program and with supporting um, other people in your lives um, with alcohol and the drug use. I'll stop talking, and hopefully there are some questions now that um, people would like to ask. Thank you so much for that, Francis. It was really interesting to see the program, um, and we can you know, it's quite obvious how thoughtful you have been um, and your team's been in taking that evidence base from the literature as well as combining it with the co-design and the stories from family and friends. Um, it also looks like it's going to be really interactive, which is always a winner. Uh, I should say the team will probably uh, scold me a little bit when I get off because I've been talking about activities and they talk about interactivities because <laughs> that's the very reason we've tried to be um, quite interactive, yeah. Um, 
Well, we do have a few minutes for questions um, and some have already come through, but I just like to encourage everyone on the line, if you do have a question, now is your time to send it on through. Um, so just to start off with, how someone was wondering, how do I just support family members um, heal and recover if they've made that decision um, to cut ties with their loved one who is a substance user? Okay, so that's, I'll just um, make sure I'm understanding it. So this is a situation where a family has decided to draw a, a hard line um, yep. in relation to the person in their lives who is using alcohol or other drugs so that there's no contact. And, and certainly there does, there are many examples where um, that's necessary and important for a whole host of reasons. Um, and the question is about how do we support the family in those yes years. that's correct yeah um uh i guess i've said it a little bit before and i'd also be keen to hear um if anybody with that lived experience is online and is willing to share but i think the ver the first thing to do is to not avoid the person nor avoid the issues um, talking about these experiences and feelings will not make the feelings worse and, in fact, bring a lot of relief to people, particularly if they are with a trusted person, a person who cares and a person who's just prepared to let the, the family member talk. Often we, um, as family members who are supporting loved ones with mental health or alcohol or drug use problems, just get our heads down and try to get through the day. And we rarely carve out time or space to just to think about um, and process that experience. And that's often what then leads to depression, anxiety down the track. So it's a, the very, very simple thing is to say, just create some time, some regular time to check in, to let the person talk and just to share their experience and um, without providing any advice, without providing any judgments um, about the decision, just being there to listen. Yeah. Um, that's my number one. <laughs> yeah, so it's really about maintaining that sort of connection and giving yeah, people not the opportunity. Not dropping out of existence or avoiding it, yeah. Because yeah. It can be yeah. a bit unpleasant and, um, you know, you can have a cry together and those sorts of things, but I think that's what's really important is that connection. Yeah. Um, Someone was wondering what the reason behind asking people to register to access the program, um, why that is, and do you think that could be a barrier for people who may be concerned that their details could be linked to substance use or, you know, there is quite a bit of stigma around substance use. Um, yeah. What was your main reason for asking people to register for the program? That's a really good question and I love that somebody's asked that. Um, so the number one reason is that um, by registering um, with your email, it can be even a made up email, um, but that just means that you can come into and out of the program, store and save any of your information, um, and pick up where you've left off. So it really was just to help people um, get, uh, I guess, get, get to the information that they need as soon as possible um, and to, I guess, build an experience or, or build a, a toolbox of things that are relevant just to them, I guess, to tailor their experience um, of the program. Program. Um, what I can assure you is that the, the data that you or the stories and the information that you enter um, doesn't come to any of us as, as the research team sitting behind it unless you specifically agree to share it with us um, and where those opportunities are. It's clearly outlined. Um, and that's also why we wanted to have ourselves on um, some of the videos throughout so that you can see who you're sharing that information with. Um, and that also our the privacy and the security around um, our, where our website is hosted and stored is actually on the same server uh, server as serve server as the Australian Stock Exchange. So it's about as secure as we can get um, here in Australia, um, and is compliant with all the Australian standards. Now that doesn't necessarily address the other issues that you mentioned. So there is stigma around. Um, substance use um, and a lot of concern about having to, um, you know, leave that data and leave that information somewhere and not being um, sure what's happening to it or, or what Google or other sorts of plugins might, might work their way in. Um, and so we'd be really interested to see whether that is actually a barrier to people um, completing the program because our most important goal is to connect people with this program when they need it. Um, and so if that's deterring you, then please um, feel free to let our team know and we can work with you to do to do another way of, of logging in um, or to um, perhaps think of removing that, that need, that program there. Yeah, that's fantastic, Frances. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, how you say that people can uh, log in and have a look at the information when and how they need it. Do you need to do the modules in order or can you pick the module that is most relevant to you at that time? 
Um, and can you also redo modules? I mean, I, I have to say for my memory, I would probably need to redo some if it'd been a few months since the last time I looked at them. Uh, absolutely. Well, we redo it for a different reason. That's to keep seeing us on video. <laughs> um, no, in seriousness. Um, so I think that that's really important. But at the moment, you do um, you need to at least start a module. You don't need to finish a module in order to activate the next module. Um, and you can you can certainly click through if you wanted to all the pages of a module um, in a very quick way. So you don't necessarily have to complete every single page in order to get through a module. So certainly there is. Um, we would recommend that people do the core modules one at a time and then um, pick and choose from all the um, school modules as they need to. But certainly for those first core four core modules there um, you need to just start one before the next one becomes available um, but from the skill modules they are available whenever people need them so if you're ready to get in and learn how to manage unhelpful thoughts or manage worry then you can go straight in and do that excellent that sounds like you've designed it really well we've tried to but again really happy to receive feedback to the contrary <laughs> Um, someone was wondering if um, a health professional wants to access the resources do they have to register at the moment, anybody who wants to access the resources does need to register. Um, but that can be with a, you know, a health address, a work address. So I've registered with my university address. Um, and you can give yourself any name that you like. You can say health provider or, or whatever it happens to be. And that'll just be the way that you then log into your program. It doesn't come to us and we don't track that. So, yes, you do need to register. But again, let us know if, if that's a barrier. Um, and we have another question. Um, someone was wondering, how did you engage with family and friends of someone with a substance use issue? Um, was it through AOD services or was it just a general call out? How did you find um, the people with lived experience? Really good question. Um, we used, uh, we put a general call out on social media. And so people themselves saw and responded to um, that call. We tried to target people who had, had expressed an interest in um, alcohol, you know, alcohol and drug related issues. We also put our notices on um, some of our partner web, uh, Facebook pages and, and social media who were involved in caring um, for people with alcohol and other drug use problems. Um, and I guess that begs the question of whether we can, whether we validated any of the lived experiences. Um, so certainly not for the 370 odd who provided um, their survey data, um, but certainly the 17 people that we spoke to um, on the phone and who they were identified from the survey respondents. Um, there was no denying that their lived experiences were very real and very raw and very genuine. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, and some of them were, I did have a, um, a loved one who was engaged with an alcohol and the drug service, but largely the experience of people was that the, the drug and alcohol services were, were mainly engaged with in relation to the person using the substance as opposed to supporting them themselves. Yeah, and it sounds like through that methodology, you would have um, had quite a wide range as well, which I guess is obvious from some of the data that came through about the different substances and the percentages. We, um, we, did, we, we can always do more and um, <laughs> as we go forward, we'll look to make sure that those experiences are still um, representative. Um, but yes, we tried to go as widely as we possibly can with respect for people's time yep. and ability to, to, you know, create the headspace to share that, um, those experiences with us. Yeah. Yes. Um, someone is interested in um, obtaining more information on the evidence-based research that you did with the community. Um, are you having any plans to publish that data or making any of the survey um, like reports available? Oh, is that someone from my team? <laughs> uh, well, it's not a name that I recognise, but maybe you're getting a prompt. Uh, that's a great question. And I'm, so, again, so glad that that's asked, again, in all seriousness, because part of what we do want to, um, to share in a number of different um, formats is this, this evidence base, given that there's so little to start with. Um, so we haven't delivered yet. When I say we, I haven't delivered that yet. Um, but certainly my team has done a fabulous job of analysing the data, analysing the interviews, and we are working together on several publications um, at the moment. We're not publishing them in report form at the moment, um, because when you do so, um, you're not then allowed to go 
publish them in journals and we would like to, to improve the scientific literature as, as well as we uh, try to improve the, um, the implementation literature. So we're going to prioritise getting some journal articles. We've tried to represent the quotes um, and the stories and the experiences in the program that people can find more information out about, but stay tuned um, for those publications, hopefully soon. Perfect. Um, um, early in the new year, team. Yeah. <laughs> Hear that, everyone? Francis has made promises now. And yes, it is probably, you know, much more important to add to that evidence base in the literature and to encourage other countries to create similar programs to this one. Um, as I, I, I believe it's one of the world first, isn't it, Francis? There isn't anything like this out there. That's correct. Not that we've been able to find yet. Yeah. Um, I have another question from a health professional perspective. Um, so if a health professionals wanted to use this program in their own services um, to deliver, you know, care to families, is there a way that it could be modified to make it more uh, place based or locally uh, sensitive, particularly to um, cultures and different cultures and communities? I, gosh, there's some good questions. I would absolutely love for that to happen. Um, and I would really welcome an opportunity to do that um, place-based modification as needed. Um, very happy to make the resources available and to work again with um, whoever is appropriate to help us do that. And I really encourage you to get in contact um, with the team um, if you'd like to do that. Um, and certainly we do have ways of being able to integrate our digital tools within clinical services. Um, you know, and it might even be in a you know very early stage if you're um, a, a clinician who's helping a person with an alcohol and a drug use problem if you have a family session to then be able to uh, you know, provide you know a card that, that gives the family member access to that um, the online website um, if they need it um, or to the person with the alcohol and the drug use problem as a way to, to broaden their perspective on the impact of their use potentially so there are lots of ways and, and clinical tips that we could think of um, and maybe we should open up another section on the website around that um, and then tailor some of those needs to local context so please get in touch yes similarly and you know with you know a few seconds to spare um Thanks someone that, was wondering <laughs> if um it would be possible to incorporate this somehow into a peer support group uh which is slightly different to a more clinical setting oh i would love this because the way i view the online program is that it potentially helps do the skill building and the like doing an online course might teach you um you know a new skill or a new give you a, a new way of thinking about things but it cannot replace some of that real-time connection and storytelling and support that is a necessary component of lots of clinical interactions but also of that um that that journey and that re that recovery and that that feeling like you're coping and so i feel like the ideal model for me would be to set up even a you know an online social network that's led by peers with a lived yep. experience um, of caring for loving someone with an alcohol or drug use problem and then having this um, program as a plug-in or something that people could access or that the peers might refer to if there's something helpful related to the conversation that's come up um, and have that kind of virtual um, supportive network um, being led by people with that lived experience. So stay tuned. Again, get in contact, please, because we we have the technology to do that and we'd love to be able to work with some people to make that happen. That's fantastic. So not only have you launched this amazing new program today, you've also come up with a few thousand other ideas to make it even better and come up with more research to better support families and communities. I love it. Oh, we love it too. Uh, my poor team's probably passed out now because I'm... <laughs> But um, we, we are really passionate about this area, um, as we are all of our areas um, of work, and we'd just love to work more with, with the people online and our community to, to help make people's paths a bit easier through life. That's amazing. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Professor Kay Lampkin. Uh, sadly, that is all we have time for. If you didn't get your question answered, please feel free to email me and I can discuss the and get an answer back to you as soon as possible. Um, we really appreciate you and your team's insights today, Professor Kay Lampkin, um, and it's been amazing to see this program come from a tiny little idea into a beautiful, huge resource that can be really supportive for the community. So we will be holding more webinars uh, throughout next year and putting new resources on Cracks in the Ice. So uh, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to subscribe to the Cracks in the Ice mailing list. Um, and we will be putting the recording and as well as the link to the FFSP AOD 
uh, program on the Cracks in the Ice website. So check that out. Um, thank you all for joining us again today. Um, thank you to Felicity and Dara for your background support of this webinar. And I hope you all enjoy your weekends. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care of each other.